Um, I hope that everybody's having a really good release party and anniversary celebration. Um, of course, due to time zones, I wasn't here for the early parts of today, but I'm going to certainly look at the videos uh, later. But uh, yeah, it's it's really nice to just get together and uh, share stories and uh, learn about new things. And it's it's always it's like a, a mini flock uh, for the release party, so it's it's really nice. Okay, so uh, I didn't have a whole lot of time, so I have a bunch of things I was thinking about talking about. Uh, so I may ramble along for a while, and uh, I may run out of time, or I may not, because I haven't uh, really practiced this yet. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, first of all, uh, I, a little disclaimer up front. Uh, I'm going to actually be talking about a lot of stuff that happened in the very early days of Fedora, so 15 or 20 years ago now. And, uh, of course, that was a long time ago, and my memory is is not perfect. Uh, and even if it was perfect at the time, it's probably uh, uh, colored by my perceptions or whatever. So I may remember something that's not the way it really happened, or uh, other people may remember it slightly differently or, or whatnot. But this is my, my uh, memory of things. Um, also, a, a little disclaimer that it's been a week. Uh, we've had the release this week. Uh, hopefully, everybody's uh, upgraded to 39 and... Uh, um, enjoying the release, uh, but there was a lot of work, obviously, to, to get things out the door and all that. So uh, this has kind of like been a really busy week. So <laughs> I, I uh, haven't gotten a whole lot of things prepared. So anyway, um, let me just give you first a little bit of, of history about how I got into the open source community. Um, so I started with Unix back in the, in the 90s. Uh, so when I say Unix, I don't mean Linux. I mean, uh, Sun OS, I mean IBM RT2, I mean uh, Irix, Ultrix, all the big old Unices. Uh, so at, at university, uh, I, I played around with all those a lot, and I really enjoyed them. I thought there were strengths and weaknesses to various ones, and obviously I couldn't afford to have any of those machines at home, but uh, have had them at uh, work, and they were very uh, interesting. Um, then kind of we move along to uh, a bit later, uh, this, this new thing called Linux was coming out. And uh, I looked around and I found a, a, a thing called Red Hat Linux 3.03, if anyone remembers that uh, ancient release. And so I installed it on a laptop that I had at the time. And I was like, wow, this is really amazing. Um, so I played around with it. and. Um, learned more about the system and how to install and how to get things working. Uh, I remember in those early days, uh, it's, it's a far cry from what we have now. You know, you'd get a laptop and you'd try and boot the media on it. And then like the CD-ROM wouldn't even work after, after you booted off of it or, you know, no sound or, you know, lots of, lots of issues. And we don't have those today in part due to all the, the hard work that people have put in over the years. Um, so anyway, I got, uh, got into, uh, into Linux with Red Hat Linux 3. Um, then uh, a little later, uh, my professional career, I was working for a Linux consulting company. Uh, there was actually not very many of us. There was three of us in the company at first. Uh, and then we added gradually a few more people. But we did consulting for folks that had Linux servers. Um, and a lot of them were running at Red Hat Linux uh, or various other uh, uh, variants. And at that time, um, Red Hat Linux was a box set, a CD set. So you would buy the new version, you'd get the, the CD, and there'd be like tons of updates that would come along. And you know, at that point, the network wasn't that great and it took you forever to download all these updates. And so we start, I started uh, my own distribution based on Red Hat Linux that pulled in all the updates and just respun stuff and added a few things uh, on the top. And, uh, and that was fun. You know, got it. Our customers could get all the updates, and we could install without having to pull down the updates, etc. Um, and that kind of led into deciding. I was somewhat active uh, in the in the local community. We had a, a Linux users group uh, nearby, and I would go to that and and talk talk to folks there. Um, and I, I really like the community aspect of things. You know, you could ask a problem, you could have people answer you, you could contribute things. Um, 
And so then shortly around this time, uh, this is now we're talking maybe 2004, 2005, uh, Fedora Extra started up. So Red Hat Linux made way for Fedora Core and Fedora Extras, which was the extra packages on top. Um, and at the time I was using the XFCE desktop, uh, which I enjoyed quite a lot. And it turns out that the maintainer of that in Fedora Core uh, was also the maintainer of KDE and a bunch of other packages. And they just did not have any more cycles to, to handle XFCE. So they wanted to hand it off to extras. So I said, well, you know, here's my opportunity to get into a, a larger community thing and contribute back and, and, and learn things and it'll, it'll be great. So I stepped up, I said, I'll, I'll take, take on maintenance of this. Uh, you know, what do I need to do? And let me stress here that I had no idea what I was doing at this point. I mean, I did not know how packages worked. I didn't know spec files. I didn't know how to build things. I didn't, I didn't have a, a lot of uh, information, but I decided to give it a try. Um, and so I said I would uh, support it. And they said, okay, well, the first thing you need to do is update to the new version. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll update to the new version. Here, how does this look? And you know, I got some feedback. Some people were like, well, you, this is not right. This is not right, but you can fix those things. Okay, great. And so that that went along. Everything was going good. I was very happy. And you know, there's this community, there's a mailing list, there's people I can ask. And then uh, a new major version of XFC came out and it needed a lot of changes. There were packages that were different. There was dependencies that were different. There was build stuff that was different. And I had no idea about most of this stuff. So I, I took a, a blind cut at it. I was like, here, I think this, this is what we need. And I got a, a bunch of critical feedback, some of it productive, like, oh, you can't do that, or this is wrong, or whatever. And some of it not productive, like, you know, oh, why are you even doing this? You don't have an aptitude for it. You're probably not, you know, somebody that we want maintaining this stuff. Um, and at that point, that's when uh, the the first person I want to talk about today uh, stepped into the limelight. Uh, my sponsor in Fedora Extras at the time uh, was a person that many of you here probably know, uh, Tom Spot Calloway. Uh, Spot has been around forever. He's he's less active uh, these days, but uh, Spot was my sponsor, and he seemed like a nice guy. And when the critical comments showed up, you know, saying this guy doesn't have what it takes, can't be a maintainer, Spot stepped in really forcefully and he said, look, no, that is not the way open source works. They're learning. We teach them how to do it right. We move on. We don't tell people they can't do things just because they did something wrong. We all make mistakes. We make mistakes all the time. And we just learn from them and we move on and we get better and we help other people. And that really, really stuck with me. That was a very powerful thing uh, for me in open source communities you know, seeing critical comments or seeing critical uh, uh, ideas coming back and then having somebody push back against that and say, no, that's not how our community works. We help people. We, we work with them. We, we get them to learn from their mistakes. Uh, and I don't know how many, again, how many of you know Spotter have interacted with him, but he has been so key to packagers over the years. I don't know how many people he has sponsored and worked with and taught uh, how to build things and how to, to correct things and work through mistakes and so forth. And he has always been extremely patient. Um, and I, I think this is, this is an aspect uh, that we really want to cultivate. We want lots of these people in our community. We want people who are patient and willing to help people out and know that you don't know things immediately. You don't step into something and just know how to do it. You have to learn how to do it. That means making mistakes. That's fine, but we need that kind of uh, kind of person in our community. And, and Spa is definitely one of those for me, at least. Um, now, there's lots of people I could talk about, and I I'm going to here in a moment. But um, I, I just wanted to mention him as as an early contributor, as someone just starting out. That sort of thing is really important because if somebody had not come along and said, no, that's not how we work, here's how we do things, I probably would have said, oh, okay, maybe you're right, I'm not cut out for this, bye, I'll just, I'll just go do something else. And we've not only lost a contributor, but we've made other contributors look at that and go, oh, I don't know if I wanna contribute there, there's, there's problems and, and they're gonna yell at me when I make mistakes. So 
it, it's hugely impactful to have that uh, welcoming and patience uh, for new folks um, going on. I seem to be getting photo bombed here by a kitty. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, really quickly, I'll move on to a second mentor that uh, that uh, was very important to me. Uh, so I got into packaging and I got pretty good at it and I maintained a whole bunch of packages. But then I started getting involved in uh, release engineering and infrastructure tasks, um, which there were many, of course. And there, um, the person I really looked up to, and uh, many of you uh, were fortunate enough to work with this uh, person as well. And, and I'm talking, of course, about uh, Seth Vidal. Um, Seth was uh, sadly taken from us way too soon, but he, again, was someone who, when I first started working in a community or asking to contribute, was very patient and very uh, teaching. He would say, you know, here's what you should do. Oh, you made a mistake here. Here's how you correct that, and, and you, you move on. Um, I, I can't count the number of things uh, I learned from him. Um, he was obviously very smart. He had a lot of uh, skills, did tons of things moved us from Puppet to Ansible, he wrote Funk, he wrote Yum, uh, all these things, but he, yet he found time for contributors. If somebody asked a question, he would maybe not answer them immediately, but he would answer them and he would patient, be very, very patient about it. Um, he, uh, one of the things he taught me uh, that I always think of is uh, one day we were on IRC and I went off to go have lunch. So I was off, I ate my lunch, I came back, and he had asked me a question and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I was at lunch. I, I couldn't answer your question. And he said, don't, don't apologize for things like that. Don't apologize for something that you're gonna do. You shouldn't feel sorry for going to have lunch. You should have lunch. You should, you should enjoy that. You should, you should be happy and not, not apologize for that. And those sort of things you know, give you more confidence and make you realize uh, things that you, you don't uh, need to be ashamed of or apologize for or be uh, tentative about. Um, so he, he definitely taught me that. Um, one of my favorite memories uh, with him was uh, a Fedora activity day that we had, um, which would have been in 20, 2012. Uh, we scheduled a Ford Fedora activity day to work on the two-factor authentication uh, that we wanted to roll out. And so we carefully planned it and we planned all the people that we wanted to, to get there and we had it in, in Raleigh. Um, and everybody arrived, and we, we sat down in this uh, conference room, and uh, Seth just, like, organized everything. He was like, okay, here's all the things we need to do. You do this, you do that, you do that. And, you know, and a lot of times when a bunch of people are working on something, you see a few people working on something, and a lot of other people just kind of waiting for them to finish or working on something else or, you know, not central to the task. But at that fad, every single person was working on something that was important, that was that mattered to the task at hand. You know, people were packaging things. Other people were reviewing those packages. Somebody was writing a puppet manifest. Somebody was doing this. And it, it just all gelled. I mean, it's like 12 people working greatly in concert. And I, I think largely it was because of his, his ability to just organize people and get them all moving in the same direction. Um, a final thing I want to mention about him is um, he had a way of taking ideas that you would you would have and making them like ten times better. So you would suggest something. You'd say, "Hey, could could we do this?" Or you know, "This this might be a good idea." And he would look, think for a minute, and then you go, "Well, that's a good idea." But what if you did this and this, and then your idea is suddenly you know vastly better, and you didn't think of those things. Um, and again, very patient, uh, wonderful, wonderful person. And I miss him all the time. Um, and I guess, I don't know how much time I have left because I'm way over, but uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to finish up here with a, a few thoughts about uh, mentoring. Um, you know, there are formal mentoring processes where you have you know, an assignment. There are, here's a pool of mentors, here's a pool of mentees, we assign people, etc. But in communities, you often get these cases where there's a pool of mentors, a pool of mentees, 
and they just find each other. You know, they don't, there's no assignment going on. It's just, you know, that you can ask questions of this person. They'll be patient and they'll respond to you and, and answer you. And I, we definitely need to cultivate that. And we need to make sure that our mentees, you know, realize that after they've gotten started in the community, they should start mentoring people too. They should answer questions. They should help people out. And it just, you know, it snowballs from there. And that's that's really how open source works, how the community works, uh, especially the Fort Fedora community. Um, and finally, uh, just a last plug, if you're looking for a place to contribute, there's a ton of places looking for people. Uh, obviously infrastructure, we always are looking for folks to help us out with things. Uh, but the websites team is always looking for folks to help out. Uh, the docs team could definitely use some help with folks writing documents, helping with the document pipeline, uh, that kind of stuff. The server working group, uh, these folks uh, are working on all kinds of things and just don't have some man enough manpower and uh, person power, and they they could definitely use some help as well. And of course, packaging and, and things like that are always good. But, uh, you know, there's just so many places to contribute, and you just kind of uh, dive in and find those people who are helpful to you in those areas. And there are people in all of those areas that are going to answer your questions. They're going to be patient to you. They're going to be a mentor if you continue to contribute in that area. Um, so I would urge everybody to, to think about it and think about taking that first step and, and talking to folks. Um, I think that's the bulk of what I wanted to go over. I don't know if anybody had questions for me or, or whatnot. Um, See if I can see the Q&A tab. Okay, nope, I don't think so. So uh, I think that's that's about it for me. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, if anybody uh, wants to catch me on Matrix or IRC or any medium, uh, email, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs>